many, many people in this room probably are familiar with. If you are, let me see your hands. Right, awesome. Um, so this quote, I love this quote from Jane Jacobs. This really kind of encapsulates uh, the work that we are attempting to do at Street Plans with that, the fact that city planning as a discipline has lacked tactics for a very long time to get things on the ground quickly, right? So this presentation and a lot of our work is about trying new methodologies and new approaches to working with communities, working with cities, um, to make places more livable. Um, to offer a very succinct um, and wonky definition for a wonky term, um, what defines tactical urbanism to us is that it you know, does not have to be led by the guerrilla urbanist, you know, with no permission, although that's certainly possible. Um, cities are engaged in this work now, cities are funding this, cities are trying to find better ways to be tactical about project delivery, and that's really exciting to us. Um, but really what defines whether you are working at the city, whether you're a nonprofit, or whether you're just an activist, is this intent, right? Tactical urbanism is about the long-term change, the policy infrastructure. Whether you're acting for half a day or you're acting over the course of several years, you're trying to achieve that long-term goal and finding new ways to, to get there. Um, why this approach? I, mean, I don't think I have to really explain this to this audience, like this above um, graphic. Those are just traffic crashes in the past five years in the New York and Philadelphia metro area. Um, that's shocking. I think we all probably believe that. Um, but how do we respond to that quickly? How do we respond to that in a meaningful way with communities? Um, one way is to actually get the people who are in, responsible for developing our traffic transportation systems to understand new materials, new processes to engage community and deliver projects faster that create safer streets for all of us. Um, so on the bottom there is a, is a fun image from uh, Auckland actually last summer of uh, 2015. I was in Auckland doing a workshop and training with Auckland Transport about how they could get bikeways on the ground faster, either through uh, demonstrations with communities for a day or two or through pilot projects. So that was us out in the field actually testing out um, traffic tape, which they had not used in this manner before, just using simple spray chalk to get this uh, bike lane down on the ground very quickly. Um, this employs this methodology of building projects, learning from the successes and failures is absolutely part of this process. Um, it's all about the build, getting something physical out onto the street or in the public realm, um, and then of course evaluating it, either for you know a short period of time or a long period of time. Hopefully we can get projects to iterate so that they are able to be looked at and measured over time so you're understanding really the successes and the failures and shortcomings of your design. Right, so this is all about preventing those big, dumb engineering projects from dropping the streets and then realizing they don't work for people. Um, so this is a very counteractive uh, approach that's counteractive to that. Um, there's now been a huge uh, amount of guidance and documents coming out recently. We heard yesterday about the Slayer Street Guide in St. Louis, which we think is excellent. Uh, you know, from Vision Zero, NACTO, the books and handbooks that we've been a part of. Dell Architects has a great book called Planning by Doing, Memphis, Los Angeles. Um, so cities are, both from bottom up and top down, engaging in a, and, and um, uh, proceeding to move tactical projects in one way or another. But after we released a full-length book uh, in 2015, you know, we had to have two chapter in there, and there was only so much information we could put in there. Um, one of the things we heard was, great, we'd love to have two, but we need a lot more information on, on, on guidance, on materials and design. And, you know, from community groups, from city leaders who want to say yes to these kinds of projects, give us something that we can say yes to. So this new document that we're releasing in a matter of weeks uh, with funding from the Knight Foundation is all about working with planning engineers, you know, public works departments, and advocates and bring them both to the table to look at ways that projects can be delivered very quickly and effectively um, with a range of very short-term to longer-term interim design materials. So here's this project delivery um, Theory. This basically is a, an adaptation of a similar graphic that appears in People for Bikes Quick Build, only we add on the context and need during the evaluation, working with community on the front end, and the demonstration would be a really critical part of this project delivery process and cycle. So context and need is about, again, looking at existing data, looking at existing problem areas, community feedback, and understanding what can we do on a block, on a street, corridor, a neighborhood, etc. Getting to a demonstration project and hopefully doing that quickly. Uh, so this is the, the materiality and the, the, the permitting of policies that you need for the um, for the one day to the one week. Pilot projects being perhaps one month on the very short end, 
to a year, sometimes even longer. So there's a whole set of materials that are appropriate for that time interval. And then interim design. So once your pilot has been a success, how do you then uh, keep maintaining and stewarding that space or that uh, facility to work and work well and hopefully not look terrible so that politicians, neighborhood groups, you know, sitting at large feels comfortable and excited about investing in the long-term infrastructure. And of course, all along the way, collecting data and input to understand how it's being used and how to evolve it. So the, the guide is from coming. We've broken up the materials into these six basic categories. And of course, we can't go through you know, the 50 plus materials that are in there currently, um, but we'll show you a couple examples of how we're putting together the guidance. So from barrier elements to the landscape pieces, wayfinding, which is general signing for projects, whether that's you know, uh, traffic safety signs, speed limits, wayfinding, et cetera, um, street furniture, and then of course, you know, we need to design and programming to bring life and energy and excitement to spaces that we build, even for the one day short term. So throughout the guide, as I mentioned, we've got about 50 different materials over the course of the, again, the one day to your design time intervals. Um, we've got these really beautiful drawings being done by Iris in San Francisco for us to communicate to cities and, and activists uh, what these look like and how they can utilize. So for barrier elements, as one example, um, this is a really fun example from our friend Jason Roberts. Um, recently, he was trying to mimic how we do uh, the white knockdown sticks. Um, delineator post in um, Detroit. Mm. Quick solution, five dollar baller as he called it. You know, this is a plunger with plastic white tubing dropped on top. <laughs> I always rely on Jason for new ideas. Fantastic. Very low cost, you know, easy to source. Um, it looks like the ballers that you see everywhere, whether you like them or hate them. Um, but some of the challenges are it's not immediately reflective, uh, it's really hard to adhere these, you can't really <laughs> stick these in the ground. Even the plunger doesn't stick to asphalt, unfortunately, when it does the tile floor. Um, and so this is one of these limitations. So throughout the guide, we showcase the pros and the cons, what's good and what's not, about the time intervals and material that's selected. Um, but to then take that to the next phase, right? Everyone sees these around their cities. Again, some people love them, a lot of people hate them. Um, there's a moderate cost or putting you know, for a public works department, not citizens necessarily, but a public works department easy to install and technically replace. And of course, uh, you can move them around, space them out differently, they're quite modular in that, in that way. But their durability is very limited. They look ugly once they've been hit a few times. Uh, so there's very strong aesthetic concerns about this as a way to physically protect, say, bikeways or curb extensions. Um, in fact, this is more of a mental barrier than it is a physical one. Cars can certainly drive over these sticks. Um, perhaps more rigorous of the material or more uh, responsive to interim design. So say your pilot project goes well. Well, there's these K71 bollards, uh, which are used in Los Angeles and several other cities now that withstand um, speeds that are quite high, at 65 miles per hour. They've been tested that way. So they're much more durable than your, um, your delineator posts. Um, easily installed and removed, just like delineators. Um, and they're mountable, right? So a fire truck can get curb access um, by just squashing this thing. And if it's not going over 65, the idea is that it pop it back up. Again, not doing the aesthetic concerns of a plastic baller like that. Um, so that's a quick overview of some of the information that you're going to see in there. Um, we are taking this general information and workshopping through how six different cities, so as part of this grand production of this guide, we're working with uh, Akron, West Palm Beach, uh, Long Beach, California, Austin, Texas, Washington, D.C., and Fayetteville, Arkansas. We have a range of communities where we're going to work with city planning departments and public works, as well as bringing the advocates and neighborhood groups to the table to talk through how to apply these materials at the demonstration, pilot, and your design phase, so we can start to change the product delivery model inside of the DOTs and engineering departments that tend to be less um, open to uh, transforming the way they do things. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony, who's going to talk through uh, a case study of delivering a trail rapidly in Miami, and then Julie will share one case study from Vermont. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, you know, this is a case study that we've included in the guide, and uh, it's ongoing. The, the story is going to be changing over the next six months, so um, here's the, the first part. Uh, the London Trail is a, a six-mile abandoned railway corridor. Uh, it's currently privately owned by Florida East Coast Industries, and um, the story is really about how a grassroots network can work with uh, a developer, actually, and not the municipality, to make some of this stuff happen and to build a temporary trail. So this is a six mile long trail, half of it still has the railroad ties on it, so we can't remember very much with that, but the other half doesn't have any railroad ties. And the, the meta picture, and I'm sure this is 
true in a lot of regions is Miami-Dade County is urbanizing fast. So there's a lot of people, you know, we have 45% um, of the population living on 15% of land, and they're expecting a lot of urban infrastructure that we simply don't have. We don't have a great greenway network even though we have great weather. So these are things that we still have to catch up on. We don't want to wait another 20 years to see these things happen. So my role in this is that I'm actually a neighbor. I, I chose to live close to this route because I, I wanted to have that amenity next to my house. Um, and there had been vision plans done for this corridor for decades. But the problem is that they never actually talked to the property owner to find out what they wanted. The property owner happens to have uh, been sold to a New York hedge fund. They were instructed to monetize everything. So at a certain point two years ago, uh, all of our neighbors, myself included, got a postcard in the mail, something similar to this. It said, come to a public meeting. Um, I'm a very active advocate in my community, so they knew me, they already knew that I was involved with this. And for months, we didn't hear anything except for this notice. It's a terrible way to introduce this process. So it's not transparent. These are all uh, symptoms of the conventional process, right? It's not two-way, it's not flexible. It's not meant to actually impact any sort of result. You go to a public meeting, you listen to somebody like me in a room, but we're not really meant to hear you, I think. Um, and it's not neighborly. I mean, that, that's the, the takeaway. So we formed a group, and we just started hitting them with all sorts of little um, projects, things that we could do along the side of, of the trail that didn't actually involve their property. So they kept on saying, how could you do that? We're not on your property. We're just doing things along the side of the property. And finally, um, as we were getting close to the decision point of uh, the master plan, what, what they wanted to do was develop the land with townhouses and multifamily housing. And our vision, obviously, was for a trail and a greenway. And we said, listen, guys, you need a master plan. You need to have a, a more inclusive process. And we know how to do this. You can get your bottom line, and we'll get our trail. And they didn't want to hear that. They were just going to get the approval because they had all the politicians in their pocket. Um, so we held a town hall meeting, and we invited them. It's a pop-up town hall meeting. 500 people came. Uh, they came. Um, the railroad, the only subject of this meeting was, the only agenda was ask questions. So they came up three hours. It was brutal. I mean, they just took a lashing from that crowd, and they kept on saying the same thing. We're going to give you a nice wide sidewalk. That's your trail. And that didn't, that didn't you know, go well for us. So uh, what happens is we keep on having events on the trail. We're poking the bear. We're trespassing illegally. Um, the day after, we, we had the big commission meeting where all the commissioners said, you know, we're going to go through with this. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Um, this is private property. These are private property development rights. You can't tell the private property owner what to do. Uh, so we had our 500 friends who we went to the town hall meeting go to that meeting. Um, and at the end of that, there was no way uh, that that plan was going to move forward. So the company withdrew their application and they started a master planning process that was inclusive and actually results oriented. And we actually got to a solution to this plan where 75% of the land was uh, saved as greenway in perpetuity. And there's small nodes and major intersections where there will be development, but it goes through the buildings. Um, and that was all great, but during that process, we had 500 of our closest friends go up on the days and say, I've been walking my dog there for 30 years, and I jogged there. So the railroad company called me and they said, um, we have a problem, it's a liability problem. You have your people on record saying that they trespassed, and now we have to close off every single intersection with fence and barbed wire. Um, give us an alternative, what, what do you want us to do? So, um, you know, we said, just do events on the trail. Duh, right? Let's build a temporary trail, get people out there. You want to sell this asset. We want to help you find money for it. Um, how can we help you if you don't even expose people to this trail? But mind you, this is in the heart of an urbanized area in Dade County, but nobody knows it's there because it's behind a bunch of single family homes. So it's very quiet and secluded, which is both a good thing and a bad thing because people don't know it's actually there. So all the reasons that they told us why they couldn't do it, we don't have a master plan. How are we going to make improvements without a detailed you know, master plan by another firm? Um, how are we going to issue liability? Who's going to accept the liability and the ongoing maintenance, uh, permitting, all these things, and too expensive. So that was all well and good, and we talked about that for a long time. And so we did our research uh, into making a trail. And as it turns out, making a trail is, is really easy. If you, you don't want it to be this long-term, heavy-duty asphalt project. It's as simple as laying down some sand and gravel and compacting it. And this is a temporary solution. In Miami, um, it's even more temporary because of our rain. Our weather plays a huge difference. So it's already a year old and it's starting to weather. But these are not images of the actual trail. These are images that we found on just Google 
to try to convince them, this is easy, this is not a big deal. And then we also got prices, and it turns out that it was not going to be that big of a deal. It was far beyond what a neighborhood group could accomplish. We basically had our role, which was instigating and poking the bear. And now we're continuing to do that, right? But they need to pony up on some serious money to make this temporary trail happen. Um, and they sort of sat on that and, and didn't pay any attention to us for a long time. And we created this pamphlet that really detailed for them how the physical improvements of the trail and the materials, how they would build the thing, and then how they would use it. So every month, every phase, we would say, in month four, you're going to do um, you know, some remediation of some warehouses, and this is what that might look like. And in month five, we're going to do a trail, and this is the activities that we're going to do on the trail. Um, and that didn't go anywhere until one day the CEO of the company went on his first bike ride on the trail after, I don't know, four or five years ago in this thing, and realized, oh my gosh, this is a great asset. We should do some stuff on it, right? Um, so they had this pamphlet, and they said, okay, let's do this. And they did their homework, and within one month of that bike ride, that was in August, this was um, in October, $200,000 later, they had removed the berm um, and created and put the gravel in for three miles worth of this trail, for six miles worth of three miles. Uh, and so th that's the first part of that. Um, if you build it, people will come. This was the day that they were compacting it. People weren't even waiting. I mean, these people probably had been walking there every day for the last 20 years anyway, and there just happened to be another machine there. But um, that photo really resonates with me because it means that people are going to be using it right away, which is what we want, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we love to say, what a difference a year makes because we started off with this really contentious, reactive process, and we turned it around into a proactive one where we were moving together uh, with common goals. And then we started having all sorts of programming events. Um, you know, this is just one that we did in a park adjacent to the trail. So the materials here are built from some buckets filled with gravel from the trail, you know, the, the granite rocks that are usually associated with railroads. Um, and everything's branded here. Everything's Love Them Trail branded. So we get these great marketing moments. And a lot of this stuff is cheap. I mean, I think all of those umbrellas were like $100. You buy them in bulk. It's surprisingly accessible. You do things like the stage uh, was donated by the county. No, no expenses for the stage. So a lot of these things were donated. We just find people that want to put their message or their product out there and it reduces the cost for us and it reduces the cost for the railroad. Here's another, another event that we did. These are monthly events, by the way. When we set them up so that um, we're no longer that involved, we kind of handed it off because they wanted to take more of a ownership of it, uh, which we, we're still seeing how that's playing out. They're, they're realizing that they really need us to help not only think about the, the ideation and the design of these spaces, but um, but in maintaining them. Right now, it doesn't look that great because they have to turn away. But this was our, our last event in December that we actually took the lead on. And these are just uh, paper bags with little candles. Um, and there was no, they didn't light on fire or anything like that. It was just a, a, a great event. And we had, um, I think we had 3,000 people there that night. There's nobody in this picture because I was showing everybody away so I could get my pretty shots. But um, we, it was full of people. So I think that's. Uh, that's all I got for London Trail, but it's an evolving story, and maybe next year it'll get the. <coughs> okay, thanks. Um, great. So my name's Julie, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a case study from Burlington, Vermont. Um, so Street Plans is working on Burlington, Vermont's first uh, walk and bike master plan, um, and as you see, this is a little shot of the existing network of bike infrastructure. It's not much of a network. There's some bike lanes and some shared use lanes and some trails, but definitely no connectivity um, and, and a really extreme pent up demand um, for, for better bike infrastructure throughout the city. And uh, through the planning process, we started to create a, a vision of what this long term network could look like. So you see there, um, you know, a minimum grid of low stress bikeways using neighborhood greenways and protected bicycle lanes. Um, as well as lots of different other types of uh, facilities to create a, a much more connected grid all through this kind of long, narrow city of Burlington. Um, so, but this is about a $55 million plan to actually build out uh, this infrastructure at you know, a capital long-term uh, cost would be very significant. And as I said, there's a really strong pent up demand and a very well-organized advocacy community in Burlington around walk and bike issues. And they had this real desire to say, you know, 20 year long term bike plan, forget it. We want to see something now, and we want to try to see as much of this as possible in 10 years. Um, well, to make that happen, of course, there's the capital cost question, but also political will. Um, and so, 
uh, I think there was a, a lot of excitement and momentum, but also definitely a common you know, pressure that may be familiar to folks in the audience where the city is really excited that the advocacy group uh, is so on board to push this through, but those aren't the only voters uh, coming to the ballot box and those aren't the only residents, right? So that's, that political will is, is, is sort of a, a challenge. The question is then, right, so how do we get there? Uh, not everyone's convinced. It's great that the advocates are, but not everyone is. One idea, okay, you know, demonstration project. Street Plans was really excited to be working on this project, and we said, you know, hey, can we start immediately? There's so many great case studies around the country of you know communities doing pop-up bike lanes to educate people. The advocacy folks from Burlington were already super hip to this idea. Everyone thought this seemed like a great idea, but unfortunately, um, you know, this this wasn't a new idea in the city, and the city had actually already had some requests before the planning process started, kind of as we were getting started from a neighbor who said, I want to do, you've seen this online, you know, I've seen the Minneapolis steal this idea, $600, great article on people for bikes, you know, I want to pop a bike lane going to my son's school. <laughs> Let me give it a go. There's some press around it. Um, the idea was, it was close to the city and the Department of Public Works, although they really wanted to say yes to it, took a look and said, we just can't, it's not safe, we don't know what you're talking about, we've never done this before, we can't have people building bike lanes in the streets. That's what our department does. We're sorry we're too slow. We don't know what else to tell you. Really disappointing for everyone. Disappointing for public works have to be the ones who say no. They, they, don't, you know, they don't want to be doing that, but they don't have a mechanism to say yes. It's really frustrating. And really disappointing for the advocates who are saying, I'm trying to deliver a public outreach to you on a silver platter. You can't find a way to say yes to me? It's really challenging. So it just underscored this disconnect you know, between there, there is energy and a desire for the advocacy community to help support this education and outreach, but there's not an easy way for the city to say yes. So um, working with DPW uh, and this advocacy group, as part of our efforts on the plan, um, we extended that a little bit and said, why don't we try to create a new policy? Let's, let's go for this. So um, we created this community-led demonstration project and policy guide. It is a, a toolkit, much like the many that we showed earlier, you know, kind of a how-to, but um, tailored into Burlington's context. And it also, um, we created a wireframe of a permit process that could work. And this involved you know, meeting with DPW, meeting with the fire department, uh, meeting with some of these other stakeholders, such as the transit authority, and trying to map out, uh, okay, we know this is a crazy idea, but if we were gonna do it, how would we do it? Who would we have to check in with? What would that look like? So with that wireframe in, in, in mind, we tested it. DPW, the advocacy organization, we all worked together, and we created a series of demonstration projects piggybacking on some events that were already happening in the city. So um, the, the top two and, and the one on the left you see are different types of bikeways. So these are you know, renderings in real time for facility types that uh, might be possible through the plan. A parking protected bike lane, a neighborhood greenway, a planter protected bike lane, um, and doing this in a really pop-up fashion. Um, and then on the bottom right, a, a curb extension parklet type public space. Um, so running these projects through the mill uh, was a really important part of it and we had the advantage of being able to, to really strategically locate and time them to coincide with some community events so we knew we'd have a lot of excitement. Um, the bikeways coincided with Burlington's Open Streets event called Open Streets <coughs> TV and the bottom one on the right, the pedestrian um, uh, focused project focused on um, around an arts walk that was happening in the uh, arts district of the city. So with that in mind, and, and kind of pulling together all the lessons learned what worked and what didn't work, we mapped out this permit process. It's a, a phased and, and tiered process. I know you probably can't read it all, but you can definitely get this online. I'll tell you, I think the key point was that the Department of Public Works stepped up and they were willing to kind of be that go-between to help the community vet the design. So if the community could come up within the parameters of the guide, the project types that are acceptable and some of these checklists we gave them to make sure that we wouldn't have any major red flags from the fire department or some of these other stakeholders, um, the community group can bring that proposal for their pop-up uh, demonstration project to the city, and the Department of Public Works can workshop it with them, and once it's in shape, it can then be passed on and vetted through a process with the other agencies. Um, so that was really exciting, and you know, really hats off to DPW in Burlington, being willing to step up and kind of take that on, because it's not easy, and um, you know, some of their colleagues thought they were crazy maybe still do, um, for now, because the program is launched. But um, with that strong signal from city government, hey, we support innovation, hey, advocacy community, we need you, we need your help in, in education and outreach, Local Motion, the advocacy group, 
really ran with this. And I saw, you know, the TrailNet uh, the presentation from Seattle and TrailNet yesterday, I saw sort of a similar theme, but um, which is really exciting. Local Motion really wanted to take it further and enable communities to do this work um, in, in a real way. So they have a, a pop-up demonstration project program. Um, it has the, a link to the toolkit, a lot of models and resources. And the really exciting part is a trailer of supplies that drives all over Vermont, wow. and communities can request this. So we're talking, you know, safety vests, um, temporary channelizers, so you know, some things you may have to purchase, paint or tape, but as much as possible, the kind of toolkit of reusable things that could be used. Um, and we had the opportunity to actually design the wrap of the, the, the trailer, it was really exciting. This shows you one side of it. Um, it's almost functioning like an information board, so that when this rolls up to a community, if you've never seen this before, it's, uh, it's sort of reminding you, hey, this is these various types of projects that you could do in a pop-up fashion, here's how you, um, you know, request this trailer, and here's how you move forward. Um, so I think just going back and, and circling back to that long-term ambitious plan, you know, trying to institute, uh, or sorry, implement a, a really you know, dense bike network in, in 10 years or so, um, and needing the political will, well, the exciting thing to me about this story is that it unlocks the power of advocates to, to really be a partner to the city in helping build that political will. Uh, because I think the take home for all this is that you can't do it alone. The city's not you know, going to be able to do this level of, of, of outreach um, alone. And the advocates could be really well positioned as a partner, especially when the city can kind of step back and create a framework for them to, to do that. Um, but it doesn't stop with the advocates. Inspired by this incredible energy, the city's also taken um, literally on the heels two months after um, these demonstration projects that I showed you, the city has sort of taken this energy and said, okay, what can we do with paint? What can we do with tape? You know, our plan isn't finalized or approved yet. Let's start getting some, some markings on the ground. So these are just a few images of the areas where they've just made some little acupuncture-esque uh, type intersection improvements just to keep that momentum going. And I think it felt really good to everyone in DPW, um, you know, can't speak for them, but even just from what I'm hearing from them is to, okay, we can get some stuff done too, and it, it feels good. Um, the city's also undertaken um, a, a pilot project of a protected bike lane on a corridor, and one thing to just tie back to the materials um, that I wanna highlight, this is a, a sample case study page from the guide um, the forthcoming guide is that Burlington is in the pilot. So the pilot is an experiment, so you know, experiment type project for that facility type on that street. But they're also using it as a lab to test materials. Um, so they're using, they're testing out uh, flexible delineators versus armadillo bumps, and saying, you know, before we try to do a rapid build protected bike network citywide, let's test some materials on one corridor, see what works in our snowy climate, what have you. So that sort of theme of experimentation and not being afraid to use a small project to experiment with materials is really, really um, important and we saw as an ingredient for success. Um, okay, so I'm gonna leave that there. Um, and I know everyone's been eating and maybe it is a little bit of a food coma, so we're gonna surprise you all a little bit and actually pose some questions to you. Is this gonna just be a kind of a call and response? We're gonna present two scenarios and ask for some quick ideas and then present one or two quick case studies that we think illustrate responses as well and then we'll take more questions, okay? And just warning, if you don't come up with answers, Tony's just gonna call on you at will, so just be prepared. This, this is participatory. <laughs> okay, so Make okay. Sure nobody leaves. He's the instigator, you can't tell. So scenario number one. Our city woke up this morning to discover that someone had painted an unsanctioned crosswalk on the street at a location where a crosswalk's been requested in the past. How do you respond? This is maybe that demonstration project level gone awry. The gorilla crosswalk, we've heard of this before. Some ideas, how could you respond as a city? Sign a crossing guard. Sign a crossing guard. Quickly repaint it. With, with standard traffic tape or standard traffic tape, okay. Another idea? Collect the data and evaluate it. Arrest them. Arrest them. Arrest them. They don't say that, that is the way you can respond. It may not be the way you can but that's the way you can respond, and some cities have. Power wash. Power wash it off. Turn a blind eye. Turn a blind eye. Yeah, in all over the world, you know, tactical urbanism happens in a much more informal way. Not common in America to turn a blind eye, but could happen. Okay, so do we have any folks from Seattle in the room? I know we have. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, I just, we, we read about this and we were like, oh, that's awesome. all right. 
Well, maybe you can tell that to us, and we read about this, and we said, no, that's, that's a good response. Okay, so this was a crosswalk that uh, was painted, and correct me if I get this wrong, but a crosswalk that was painted by the community, it was a guerrilla action. Um, it was in part about, you know, of course, a crosswalk, help people cross the street, but also really an important uh, symbol from the neighborhood about culture in a neighborhood that was ex experiencing a lot of change. So, you know, it wasn't just about walking safety, it was about belonging and a lot of other things, and so to just power wash it off, wouldn't really be the greatest response. Um, so it was, the first step was Seattle DOT said, love the idea guys, let's just bring it up to like baseline safety code, can we put some tape, can we make it more reflective? You know, and over time with spray paint, that's not gonna last, right? This is the material quality that's not gonna last forever. But Seattle um, had sort of already in the works this creative crosswalk program and this provided a catalyst for saying, okay, it's time to launch our creative crosswalk program. So that created a, a, you know, a launch pad for the city then to be able to scale up creating a framework for more neighborhoods to do more of this. And there's slightly more official channels, but at least sort of embracing that energy and codifying it and grounding it in a single process. We would so, say this is the correct answer to that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so a little bit of a quiz show here. But, so that's an example um, that we were really excited about, and it's a teaser of the type of stuff you'll get in the guide. Um, that's like a, a case study sample. Julie, real quick. Um, this one? No. Um, one thing else to mention about this project is when you are the city, who here works in a city or for government? Awesome. You are in a very unique position to take cool projects like this and scale them up. You know, it's your role in terms of equity to take a great little intervention, whether it's the poor area, the wealthy neighborhood, or middle class neighborhood, and say, look, we can actually, we have the tools and resources to offer this as a program to everybody. So that's, I think, the value with what we've seen. Seattle is that they're the ones in that position to do it, and they've done it, so and, and that's all. allow your community groups, empower your community groups to be able to do the things that you can't because of your official channels. You need that cover. So work with your groups so that they can instigate the bear. And you can tell the mayor or whoever, you know what, they already did it, what are we going to do? But <laughs> you are not going to do And thanks to that Howard, it's even there. Thanks for, Howard's the person we got to interview to learn more about this case too. So thanks um, to him. So, okay, with scenario two, total different end of the spectrum. We want to rapidly roll out protected bike lanes and curb extensions in our city using low-cost materials to meet our street safety goals. We're not sure what materials to use. We're stuck to be the best the best approach. And this is, you know, I think often comes up when you really put those white sticks there, they're gonna get knocked down, but other cities do it, but we can't, but blah, 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 we have snow, you know. What's a way to handle this? We wanna start rapid build, we don't have a materials palette. Ideas. Oh, oh, a different material throughout the test, quarter. Test yep, material. yep, okay. That was mine. Is yours? Roll it out. Yep, roll it out in a small area. Behind and then to you. We rely on the crowdsourcing maintenance of keeping our materials in Oh wow, look like some of the kind of lower cost materials. Yeah, we have cones and people knew I was involved and they're like, oh yeah, walk by every day and fix your cones whenever they're messed up. Wow. Community kind of Now where are you from? Portland, Oregon. Portland, great, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Good one in the front. And plants from the dollar store. I walk away. Love it. Any other ideas or thoughts from the crowd? Part of this is getting at procurement, how you get around procurement, if that's a problem. I hold bulk, like bulk oh, products. Bulk products. Talk to peer students, see what they've done. Mm -hmm. Talk to peer students, see what they've done. I think that's great too. And there's a lot of resource sharing there. And you know, a lot of cities, again, are willing to talk to us, uh, let us pick their brain for this guide. So we're hoping to kind of reflect back some of the best practices that we've heard. Uh, one, one more. Uh, maybe give yourself a, a time frame to make decisions. Yeah, a time frame, a time frame to make decisions. Um, and, and I might just add also in evaluation, you know, really think through evaluation, come up with that kind of metric uh, and a framework for how you're going to uh, decide if the materials are working or not. Um, so I don't know if we have any one from Austin in the room, do we? Okay, so uh, Austin, we, we love, this was an example that was shared in the group, but scale down. So when Austin's thinking about there's a you know barrier elements for uh, bike lanes or curb extensions. There's a lot of things we could use. Oh geez, before we roll this out in a whole corridor, it might be smart to test it in a small location. You all may have seen this. It was a great case study of a uh, decorative curb extension that Austin did, and at first installed flexible um, delineators. But there's a lot of construction going on in this area, uh, and the trucks were continually just I mean, within one day from my interview, I heard that some of these were down already. So. 
it, you know, while the delineators might work in some locations, they certainly weren't working here. Um, so the city tried these concrete buttons, and they, you know, that was another option as a barrier that would be mountable, maybe not get that knocked down as, as fast. Well, but they're still experimenting on the adhesives. So this is one thing that, you know, I, uh, last time I was in Austin, I got to go check this out, but, you know, they've been really trying to be meticulous about, okay, we're gonna try a new material, and we're gonna try these adhesives with these concrete, you know, kind of turtle bumps. There's a lot of factors at play. The first installation, it didn't go so well, maybe because of the time of day that the adhesive was installed, maybe because of how long it was left to set. So when you're using more of these materials, just embracing that there's gonna be experimentation, so that's why it makes sense to try it in a small way, really try to get the system down before you can, you know, before you try to scale it up. Um, okay, so we can take questions, and then this is, um, you know, just our, the website for the guide, and we're really excited to share it with you all soon. Um, go ahead. Yeah, it seems like often, like, task force or projects are focused on the local government or the neighborhood level. Have you had any examples of initiatives that have been focused on kind of regional, statewide, or national issues and how they've been funded? Mm -hmm. One, and you want to, you may want to go first. Well, I think there's two quick yeah. examples that come to sure. mind. One is, um, we worked with the regional planning entity called ARC in Atlanta. Do you have any Atlantans in the room? Um, they have a regional wide, region wide program. Uh, looking at each new place and the challenges of doing that in Atlanta where we have a lot of sprawl. Um, and so we actually did a demonstration project about all the different elements that would be in a lifelong community, as they called it, and then invited the whole region or representatives of the region into a workshop, help volunteer and deliver that project for, for two days in a neighborhood to make that real um, as a way to then inspire people in Atlanta, not just in the heart of the city where we did it, but around the region to use tactical urbanism as a way to uh, deal with challenges and opportunities in, in their own communities. And so within um, you know two years since we've done that project, you can read all the articles around the region in Atlanta of uh, both sanctioned and unsanctioned projects that have been rolled out by cities, regional leaders, advocates, et cetera. So it's been pretty inspiring. You want to talk about the sky example? Yeah, so we're really excited to be working with Alta Planning and Design and SCAG, um, Southern California Association of Governments. I don't know if you have any. One from Skag Lines, maybe, but um, they have uh, received a large grant, a federal grant, to do education and encouragement programming throughout the SCAG, throughout their six county region in Southern California. So communities were able to apply and say, yes, we want to host a tactical urbanism, uh, a, you know, project or open streets type event in our town, um, and then they were eligible to kind of participate in this program. And so here you have real serious regional leadership um, facilitating this in, in the local government level. One point about that is the uh, this is the second year of the program. So the first year they did, I think it was seven projects, so now it's nine. So we're involved with uh, Alta and Skag and uh, nine different communities of various types and sizes um, and wealth levels. So it's an interesting model they're trying to think to institutionalize it. And in the future, not for need you know, consultants to help them deliver the project, but it becomes how they operate and do business to deliver education and information and experiences to then move things out of the way to allow for longer term implementation of safer streets. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about challenges with ADA accessibility. I think you might have heard there's a lot of areas that just need to toss boxes in really quickly, but it'll be a lot for you to say for a We um, oftentimes build ramps. Right? So we did a project in Portsmouth this spring that a very specific concern about accessibility. And we just had a volunteer who was good with wood and tools and built an ADA compliant ramp from the mm -hmm. sidewalk to the curb extension that we painted in and the crosswalk that we put down and that resolved the issue very quickly. And and there is a company that will make anything. Just Google them. There's temporary <laughs> ramps that you can rent. Yeah. They're out there. If you yeah, don't have the capacity to build. Actually, we should put the ramp in the guy. We shouldn't forget to do that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, right, like the you know, plastic ones for events often used, right? But you could, you could source that. Maybe it becomes part of the toolkit. Have you guys found any tools for like the tax? Temporary of those tactical domes, the yellow ones. We did an ADA transit floating trans island where we had to have two ramps there at the end, but we had to use you know rope and duct tape to do the tactical stuff. But they really wanted us to do those yellow domes. The little bus, the little yeah, tactile. Yeah. That's a good question. Not one that I have off the top of my head, but it's a good assignment to continue researching. What about the, the pads going on? Yeah. 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 yeah, the tactile pads. Yeah, the tactile pads. Yeah. Five of them, I guess. Yeah, I wonder. I, I, I don't even have a sense of. But I wonder if something again is plastic could be reused yeah. for pop ups. Yeah, put some maybe. buttons under duct tape. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, we did rope under that thing, but yeah. Oh, smart. There you go. Other questions or anything else? There's another for urban acupuncture, tactical urbanism. Uh, do you see a difference in words? Sure, there is definitely a, there is a difference. If you read uh, Jamie's book, he's really talking about very large scale projects and he also considers acupuncture. And he also thinks about uh, multi-sensory experiences. So it's a lot about sound, it's sight, it's taste, it thinks about a lot of these things. And so he's got some of these projects that he categorizes and talks about in his career as urban acupuncture um, that are, in my mind, also tactical. So there's an overlap. Um, but we also recognize there's a real limitation to task orders in terms of scale. So I don't necessarily see you know, us prototyping uh, light rail lines. You know, um, maybe Jaime's example was, you know, we're gonna do BRT, right? So at a super large scale, maybe that you could consider that practical, but um, I think there's a, a key difference there. And we also have defined tactical to be very, very explicitly about intent, so about the long-term transformation, uh, where uh, there's not as much focus on it's implied that we have focused on the projects with urban acupuncture. So I think there are two sides at the same point. Um, you mentioned transit. Besides like what happened after Hurricane Katrina in New York, um, have you seen any, any other examples around tactical urbanism or transit? We're, we're actually doing one problem, our first ta tactical, tactical transit project right now. Um, in Miami, it's going to be a protected bus lane, the first in, in Dade County. Um, that's just part of the one project. Um, is anyone, no one is from Atlanta, but Atlanta has a called the MARTA Army, which is a great organization. Are you from MARTA Army? MARTA Army. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, they go around and put up more information about you know when the bus is going to arrive and make bus stops more comfortable around the Atlanta region, which is really well known for having very, very sad looking bus stops and not having a great amenity at their bus stop location. So um, there we go. There's a timetable right there from Whoa. the Army. Wow. The post on the signs makes it a lot easier and more transparent on how you can get information about where the bus is going to show up. So um, little projects like that have been popping up. We've actually done some bench installation projects, hmm. uh, various sites where you basically can you know, mint people, so to speak, by putting buses next to transit poles. Um, people just automatically will sit there as soon as they realize it's going to be more comfortable and might show up even there. So, benches and shade go a long way. So, yeah, there's a number of things you can do from the small scale schedule to the actual infrastructure that you're protecting or building out to grow. Kathy? So your work is art, but how much are you actually engaging like public artists in, in this work? I mean, I think the question, I think at least a mix. In the Miami projects, we have a lot of mural um, elements that we are working with artists to you know, showcase their work. Uh, I mean, there's just a lot of opportunities for that, for mural reclamation or uh, there's transit facilities that we have in Miami that we're, that the transit agency is actually asking us to help find artists to wrap their buildings and, and help them. They're turning away from that whole thing of, we can't maintain it, you know what's going to happen if we, you know, somebody comes and tags on it. They just, they'd rather see something beautiful there that might be a little bit tagged that the artists can come in kind of touch up. And there are all those big gray canvases that are that are horizontal too. Right, yeah. right, right. Very yeah. Well, we, yeah, and I think that's um, one recent alley activation project um, in San Jose that we worked on. Um, the DA, so there's a ton of crime in this alley, and so the DA's community policing department actually heard about this alley activation and said, hey, hey, that's a focus site for us. We'd love to do something there. And they were able, I think the beauty of a mural is um, sometimes the public art, it's a, it's, it's a, something people can wrap their heads around really quickly, and so the DA doesn't usually engage in tactical urbanism projects, but she said, I can find a couple thousand dollars to pay an artist to do a permanent mural. So then the alley activation, which was intended at first just to be a pop-up, we got to have that leave behind um, in the alley as well. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's a part of it too. Art's, art's critical for programming as well. So in the Atlanta example, um, Atlanta has a phenomenal public art um, mural program that happens all around the city, and we had tours in this particular neighborhood. So it's a programming element that you can attract people who want to come see the art, all the different installations, and get the information behind each painting 
uh, mural um, as well. So it's a way to kind of tack on to what's already good in there in the neighborhood to draw people out to then uh, inadvertently experience this protected bike lane or this new plaza or this other piece of infrastructure that may not be as sexy to them as some really cool um, mural. Mm -hmm. And actually, an another element of that that's not actually a mural or something that's painted out in the world is bringing our work into museums as a part of an exhibit. Mm -hmm. So we did that for the Lovelum Trail. We had a class of landscape architecture students um, and architecture students create renderings of what this might look like. Nice. So it's just a, a variation of that theme, but then it, it got the message about, about the Lovelum Trail and exposed it to more people. Nice. Or just one footnote, though, that came out of the case studies, too, is thinking about engaging artists. It also really has a material, an impact on your material choices. So, for example, um, if you're using you know, acrylic-based asphalt paint, you could have an artist really easily you know, paint the plaza. But if you're going to try to use uh, polymer uh, or you know, thermoplastic, some of these uh, materials are not as easy for an artist to work with. So it's certainly a balancing act and a question um, as, as you kind of think about the time scale from the demonstration to the pilot to the interim design. Um, you know, and if, for example, it's a closet and it's you power washed, what's the right material? Um, and, and sort of what limits does that put on the artist if you want to engage them? So. Mm -hmm. nice. Okay, well, 